start. Uh, yeah, we special special welcome uh, Doctor uh, you uh, you is Kuroso Kuroso Washington. It was a Doctor you is is invited by the CSR CSR and uh, we get this opportunity to invite him also to visit uh, our town, the edge of this coast, just now, okay? Our professor here are new, and the, uh, uh, Dr. Yuri actually, uh, he was the, uh, uh, now he is the, uh, the a scientist at the uh, uh, National Climate Center, uh, Department of it, Environment and the Heritage uh, in Australia. And he was all worked with, uh, before uh, in the, Institute of Radio Physics and Electro and Electronics uh, Academy of Science in uh, USSR and uh, Russia, okay, in uh, 1985. Uh, so his major work and research research is on the uh, development of the satellite radars and the method for the environmental uh, remote sensing. And because of this research, uh, Dr. Yuris has been uh, awarded with the USSR a uh, common prize in this field of science and technology. Okay, so uh, now he is uh, kind of an uh, uh, international scientist on climate research, uh, in particular for the uh, uh, glacier uh, and the uh, sea ice. Okay, in such kind of climate issue, okay, the glacier and sea ice are such kind of migration. And also he had lead the Arctic polar expedition Okay, so they kind of escape from the polar Arctic uh, speed. If maybe you can uh, say something about how you, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, so today, uh, uh, we have this honor to uh, have him uh, to give a talk here, and his, his talk is the climate, uh, climatic hazards. Okay, talk about that sort of cli uh, climate issue, uh, current happening in this, uh, on this world. Okay, that's where you come, that's a new list. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to present some of my research on climatic hazards at the National Central University. Uh, after a brief introduction on climate change, I will highlight importance of satellite remote sensing for environmental studies. And then I will talk about uh, studies on tropical cyclones and thunderstorms. In the first part of my presentation, I will highlight importance of uh, uh, tropical cyclone database and its high quality, influence of El Nino Southern oscillation phenomenon on tropical cyclone activity, tropical cyclone trends, climatology, and seasonal forecasts. Then we will discuss mapping of thunderstorms and lightning and trends in this severe weather phenomena. And in the last part of the presentation, I will highlight the importance of global navigation satellite system radioaccultation methodology for deriving atmospheric parameters. Uh, the Norwegian Nobel uh, uh, Rice Committee awarded Nobel Peace Prize in 2007 to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, and Mr. Al Gore for their efforts to build up and disseminate greater knowledge about man-made climate change and to lay the foundation for the measurement that are needed to counteract such changes. In the press release of the committee, it is said that through the scientific reports it has issued over the past two decades, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Changes has created an ever broader informed consensus about the connection between human activities and global warming. Thousands of scientists and officials from over 100 countries have collaborated to achieve greater certainty as to the scale of the world. 
In climate change 2007, the fourth assessment report of the IPCC, it is stated that warming of the climate system is unequivocal and most of the observed increase in globally average temperatures since the mid-20th century is very likely due to observed increase in anthropogenic greenhouse gas concentrations. Climatic hazards become more frequent and severe in recent years. They affect about 250 million people around the world and cost over $60 billion a year. Attempts have been made to establish connection with climate change and increase in number of extreme natural disasters. From the beginning of my career in early 1980s, I was studying severe weather phenomena. Uh, I conducted research at the USSR Academy of Scientists uh, focused on satellite remote sensing, developing uh, microwave sensors and methodology for in data interpretation. That time, and it was more than 25 years ago, American and Russian scientists just began to discover unique opportunities which satellite remote sensing can bring to environmental scientists. Our first studies were focused to monitoring oceans and polar environment with the aim to avoid potential marine hazards. First experiments were conducted with surface-based remote sensing systems and when optimal characteristics of microwave centers were developed, then we moved on and developed space-borne systems. One of the most successfully recognized environmental satellite project was Cosmos 1500 satellite which was launched in September 1983. And radar of this satellite achieved 33 months of continuous operational service, providing international community with unique real-time information. And it was outstanding achievement compared to relatively compared to relatively short mission of uh, radars like uh, shuttle or CISA. Uh, invention of this system paved the way to systematic and long-term monitoring of the Earth's environment using satellite remote sensing, which we conducted in collaboration with American colleagues from NASA Water Space Flight Center. Um, important advantage of radars compared to optical sensors that they obtain day and night images of the Earth's surface under any weather condition. Abilities of optical sensor to observe Earth's surface is limited and dependent on thank you, uh, dependent on sunlight and absence of cloud. So since introduction of satellite radars, uh, monitoring of polar region during polar ride become possible. Using this unique information, we conducted uh, a series of uh, rescue operation. One of them was rescue of fleet of 50 ships trapped in sea ice near uh, Runhill Island in uh, Arctic Ocean in 1983, somewhere here, and uh, radar images from Cosmos 1500 satellite were the only information available during this time to rescue this fleet of 60 ships. Another famous rescue operation was rescue of research ship of Mike Somov 
drift in five meters sea ice in Antarctic waters during the winter of 1985. Study of icebergs and glaciers became also possible with this unique microwave remote sensing radar. In this slide, you can see optical image top and radar image bottom of area near Antarctica in Weddell Sea. And uh, observing Filtner Eye Shelf in 1986, we discovered breaking of ice. Here is a large area. And this shelf was breaking in a few pieces. And then this diamond shade of iceberg was located Russian polar station Drushna. Discovering this allowed us to evacuate people and avoid another catastrophe. Using this unique tool, observation of the most powerful severe weather phenomena such as tropical cyclone became also possible. Here is a radar image of a hurricane Diana approaching the American coast on September 11, 1984. Together with American scientists, we closely monitored the development of this hurricane. And we were one of the first group who used radar images to estimate power of cyclones using microwave remote sensing. Particular hurricane, this one, Diana, was estimated as having power as 120 million megawatts. For comparison, output of all world nuclear power reactors is around 370,000 megawatts, which is 300 times less. Uh, hurricane Diana was the most powerful North Atlantic hurricane in 1984 season. About eight tropical cyclones form around the globe, around the globe annually. About two-thirds of them occur in the northern hemisphere and one-third in the southern hemisphere. Tropical cyclone was significant risk for communities in island nation and coastal areas. In extreme cases, they can have devastating consequences of life and property. Like in cases, one of the most notorious tropical cyclone Tracy, which devastated Darwin, capital city of the Northern Territory, on Christmas Day in 1974. 71 direct fatalities are attributed to tropical cyclone Tracy, and it caused damage about $5 billion. 70% of Darwin buildings were destroyed, most of the population was evacuated and many never returned back. Tropical cyclone Tracy was described as disaster of the first magnitude without parallel in Australian history. The deadliest tropical cyclone ever recorded was tropical cyclone Hola, which struck Pakistan in November 1970. Up to 500,000 people lost their life in this disaster and it caused damage of 450 million dollars. A number of high impact tropical cyclone events occurred recently around the world. One of them is tropical cyclone Katrina, which devastated New Orleans in Louisiana in August 2005. Katrina was the deadliest and the costliest natural disaster in the U.S. history. At least 1,836 people lost their lives and it was $86 billion damage. It is critical then to fully understand these disaster-inducing events. 
As climate is changing on global scale, consequently, it is important to monitor changes in regional tropical cyclone frequencies, intensities, and tracks. In climate change 2007, IPCC force assessment report, it is stated that there has been an increase in Harrison intensity in North Atlantic since 1970s, and that increase correlates with increase in sea surface temperature. However, there is no clear trends in number of hurricanes, and other regions appear to have experienced increase of tropical cyclone activity as well. To better understand tropical cyclone activity in the southern hemisphere, climate change and the southern hemisphere tropical cyclone project has been established. I am leading efforts of scientists from Australia, France, Fiji, New Zealand, and United States on this project. Under the project to be developed high-quality tropical cyclone archive for the South Indian and South Pacific Ocean, we are now developing tropical cyclone climatology for the Southern Hemisphere, as well as an experimental seasonal prediction scheme for tropical cyclones. The Evil Meteorological Organization established areas of responsibilities for issue of warning on tropical cyclones and archiving the data. And in the Southern Hemisphere is Regional Specialized Meteorological Center of Larry Union, Tropical Cyclone Warning Centers in Perth, Darwin, Brisbane, Regional Center in Fiji, and center in Wellington, who are responsible for this warning and archiving of the data. Satellite remote sensing is widely used for uh, deriving intensities of tropical cyclones and is evaluating of positions of the occurrences. For example, so-called Dwarak technique which was invented by American scientist Werner Dwork, is used to evaluate intensity of cyclones using visible and infrared satellite images. So-called Dwork T numbers corresponds to tropical cyclone intensity. And in this slide, there are a few examples of tropical cyclones which are assigned intensity was numbers T3, T4, T5, and T6. Uh, changes in spiral structure organization as well as development of tropical cyclones are clearly evident from satellite remote sensing data. Southern Hemisphere Tropical Cyclone Archive, which we developed, combines data since 1969, which we call satellite era. And we emphasize this because quality of data improved dramatically since meteorological satellite came in widespread. Also, specialized website for disseminating results and data, tropical cyclones in the southern hemisphere has been established. Primarily purpose for this was to develop a tool for assessing detailed information on historical data of cyclones in the southern hemisphere. Tropical cyclone tracks can be displayed for the cyclone season or for the number of cyclone season, as well as individually and data on position and intensity of cyclones also could be deployed using this website. One of the most significant outcomes of this project was establishing tropical cyclone trends in the southern hemisphere. For the last 25 years, we did not find any apparent trends in occurrences of all tropical cyclones in the southern hemisphere. And I just would like to remind you statement from IPCC Force Assessment Report 
that there is no clear trend in number of tropical cyclones yet. However, a significant positive trend in occurrences of severe tropical cyclone was found. Here, we define severe tropical cyclone as cyclone with central pressure less than 945 hectopascals, which approximately corresponds to hurricane on Sophia Simpson scale 4 and 5, uh, cyclones intense as tropical cyclone, Katrina. Using data from Southern Hemisphere Tropical Cyclone Archive, we were also able to develop tropical cyclone climatology. Traditionally, climatology expressed as an average annual value that is mean values of something temperature range for tropical cyclone over the whole length of record. This map demonstrates the average annual number of tropical cyclones in the southern hemisphere, showing the geographic distribution of cyclones, maximum of their occurrences. However, we developed new approach to tropical cyclone climatology, taking in consideration influence of El Nino southern oscillation phenomena. El Nino Southern Oscillation, or short ENSO, is the most important coupled ocean atmospheric phenomenon which influence climate variability on interannual scales globally. There are two phases of the phenomenon, El Nino boom and La Nina cold phases. During El Nino, Substantial warming of sea surface temperature in equatorial and near equatorial areas of Pacific occur in La Nina, it is cooling. And this change in sea surface temperature also coupled with significant changes in atmospheric circulation. Analyzing separately occurrences of tropical cyclones in El Nino and La Nina years, we were able to find significant variation in geographical distribution of tropical cyclones over the southern hemisphere, depending on warm or cold answer episode. For example, in the southern Pacific, warming enhance tropical cyclone genesis and development in this area in La Nina year, in El Nina years, when cooling in La Nina years suppresses such development. This connection with between tropical cyclone activity and El Nina were analyzed further and correlation between tropical cyclone number and uh, different ANSA indices was established. Some of the indices which you may be familiar like southern oscillation index or sea surface temperature anomalies in regions like Nina 3.4 or Nina 4. One composite X index which was developed by Klaus Walter is called multivariate ANSA index, and five variable index which we developed at the Australian National Climate Center, which takes in consideration both atmospheric and oceanic response, incorporating five components. Uh, first principal components of mean sea level pressure at Darwin and Tahiti, and sea surface temperature at Nina 3, Nina 4, and Nina 3.4 areas. Uh, I'd like to remind you that tropical cyclone season in the southern hemisphere is from November to April, and you can observe strong correlation between ANSA indices and tropical cyclone prior to the season, which gives us opportunity to achieve certain skill in correlating 
cyclone numbers with answer indices. In this slide, time series of total annual number of cyclones in the Australian region, which is defined as area south of the equator between 90 and 160 degrees east. And two of those indices, uh, NINJA 4 and 5 variable indices, is presented. Correlation is good, and it gives us at least possibility to give communities warning about active or inactive tropical cyclone season when we know which answer phases we are expecting to have in the current season. Now we are working on further development of this scheme for other areas in the Southern Hemisphere. In this part of the presentation, we will discuss severe weather phenomena such as thunderstorms and lightning. In areas like Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, northern part of Australia, severe weather phenomena such as thunderstorm and lightning can pose significant risk to communities. According to Emergency Management Australia, severe thunderstorms cause more damage in our country than any other natural hazard. During thunderstorms, hail causes the greatest proportion of the damage, accounting for nearly half of total losses from severe storm. Just an example, insuring losses in Sydney capital of New South Wales, in storm which occurred in April 1999, exceeded one and a half billion dollars. Huge hail storms with size of soft wall badly damaged, destroyed numerous cars, buildings, according to insurance, at least 35,000 of them. Lightning is another deadly hazard associated with thunderstorm. Lightning can start damaging bushfires and it also poses great threat to individuals more than any other natural hazards in Australia, accounting for five to ten lives annually and over hundred injuries. In fact, over six hundred and fifty Fatalities were registered in Australia since 1803. Taking in consideration this severity of lightning and thunderstorm on community, knowledge about spatial and geographic, uh, spatial and temporal distribution of lightning and thunderstorms are of great importance. Together with my colleagues from the University of Queensland, we conducted a study on development thunderstorm and lightning climatology for Australia. And results of this study are now form foundation for the Australian standard lightning protection. Firstly, we evaluated thunderstorm activity in Australia. Traditionally, thunderstorm activity is expressed in terms of thunder days. That is, days which thunder is heard at the observing station. We analyzed in details long-term thunder day records from over 1,500 observing stations across Australia and produced maze of geographical distribution of thunderstorms in the country. Occurrences of thunderstorm arise. The highest concentration is in northern part, and it slowly decreases southward. Peak of occurrences in the vicinity of Darwin with more than 90 thunderstorms annually. Satellite remote sensing progressed dramatically, and now it provides environmental science with valuable information for many, many directions. And one of them, which we used for our studies, 
satellite remote sensing for lightning research, detection of lightning from space. For this project, we use data from two NASA satellites, uh, from instruments which are called optical transient detector, which was launched on board of MicroLab satellite, and a succeeding instrument lightning imaging sensor, which board on tropical rainfall measuring mission. We utilize data from all available sources, firstly, of course, satellite data, as well as ground-based lightning flash counter data and long-term thunder test record, and produced maps, lightning maps for Australia for the first time. Lightning red flash density map as well as lightning ground flash density map. Just to explain, lightning, when it occurs, it occurs between cloud and cloud, which we call intra-cloud or cloud-to-cloud -cloud strikes, and between cloud and surface, which we call ground. And this portion of lightning strikes, it represents hazards for people and structures. So, two maps, total flash and lightning round flash density. Uh, here is map of uh, lightning total flash density and maps of thunderstorm accuracy and maps of lightning accuracy. Now they form foundation for our new standard lightning protection. Implementing these results help us to improve protection measures and improve protection of life and property against lightning in Australia. Apart from developing maps and implementing better protection measures, long-term records of thunderstorms and lightning occurrences allowed us to evaluate trends in thunderstorms and lightning over the past five decades. Here, trends for two localities in Australia, Darwin and Downsville, both are in tropical areas are presented, and upward trends in occurrences of uh, lightning as presented as lightning round flash density is demonstrated. Uh, we investigated the relationship between lightning and convective available potential energy and particular wet bulb maximum temperature and found strong relation between increase in wet bulb maximum temperature and increase in number of thunderstorms or increase in number of lightning ground flash density. So this relation between temperature and lightning makes it very likely that thunderstorm and lightning activity will increase substantially in warmer climate. In this part of the presentation, I would like to briefly introduce importance of new methodology, uh, GNS radiocultation atmospheric retrieval, for atmospheric research. Launch of um, cosmic constellation in 2006 provided us with unique opportunity to derive profiles of refractivity, temperature, and pressure, uh, which subsequently can be used for study of severe weather phenomena like tropical cyclones and thunderstorms. Uh, recently, I initiated an Australian study on evaluation of this technology, GNS radiocultation, and um, availability of uh, this data from six cosmic layer satellites. 
give us really unique opportunity to obtain real-time vertical profile of atmospheric parameters. In meteorology, we use radio zone observation for more than 50 years to derive atmospheric profile of temperature, pressure, humidity, and wind. In Australian region, we have 38 upper air stations. 30 of them are located on the continent. Five are on surrounding islands. And three are in Antarctica. Using satellite remote sensing technology like GNS radio occultation, we may have significant advantage, firstly, in terms of potential global coverage. As you can see from this flag, flag, some interior areas in Australia are not covered very well with upper air activation, as well as areas in the South Indian, South Pacific Ocean, where it's really important to have this data when tropical cyclone again. So potential for global coverage give us great importance for climate logistics. As well as other advantages, such as high stability, no calibration on adjustment, high accuracy, high vertical resolution, and of course, as any microwave method operation under all weather conditions. In this pilot study, we compared uh, vertical profiles of atmospheric parameters derived from cosmic radio occultation products with radio zone observation from 38 stations in Australia. Um, aim of the study was to evaluate impact of variation in spatial and temporal collocation criteria. That is distance between position of radio occultation and radio zone profile, as well as time difference between the observation. So we were aim to find what would be the accuracy of deriving parameters. Um, in brief, we found that uh, distance variation has larger impact than time variation. Uh, we also observed high accuracy of radio occultation technology for middle and upper troposphere, but for lower troposphere below 5 kilometers, we found that methodology need to be approved. As I mentioned, we adjusted the beginning of this research, so we are establishing closer collaboration with other leading centers around the world including Center for Space and Remote Sensing Research at the National University, uh, which directed by Professor Yue and Leo. In summary, uh, conducting this broad-scale climatological studies of severe weather phenomena, such as tropical cyclones, sandstorms, and lightning, we found that uh, for uh, all occurrences of all tropical cyclones for the last 25 years, there are no apparent trend, but intense cyclones are increasing in numbers. Also, indication of positive trends in occurrences of lightning and thunderstorm was observed. And relations between lightning and cave and temperature make it plausible that lightning activity will increase in warmer climate. Global warming affects everyone on this world. And climatic hazards which are observed are becoming more frequent and their impact more severe. As we found, occurrences of severe cyclone is increasing and sandstorm is increasing. 
and intensity of cyclone and lightning is also quite likely to increase in warmer climate. In its press release, Norwegian Nobel Prize Committee stated that indication of changes in the Earth's future climate must be treated with the utmost seriousness and with the precautionary principle uppermost in our mind. Extensive climate changes may alter and threaten the living condition of much of mankind. Action is necessary now before climate change moves beyond man's control. I would like to thank you for this opportunity to present our result at the National Central University. Okay, thank you. particular comment or questions about the new piece. Professor Yan Yu, any questions or comment? Okay, thanks. Uh, have you ever discovered any trend 
of the local SST where the tropical cyclone genius in the south hemisphere? I mean um, when I analyzed uh, trends in indices which described yields, I looked at the southern oscillation index. Uh, sea surface temperature anomalies, but not local, in Ninja 3, Ninja 4, and Ninja 3.4 regions, as well as I mentioned index which we developed in National Climate Center, so called five variable index. All these indices we analyzed since 1969, 1970, which corresponds to the beginning of data in our archive. So the aim was to have a look. If downward trend which we established for Australia cyclones in the southern hemisphere in Australian region for the last 37, 38 years, is it attributed to downward trend on answer or not? And yes, we found some indication that they are intercalated. In South Oscillation Index, yes, we found downward trend. In sea surface temperatures, we found upward trends, which give us indications that climate is moving towards El Nino type of climate. So, uh, no, no analysis for local SSTs, like let's say in Coral Sea or in half of Carpentaria. But in these three areas, Nino 3, Nino 4, Nino 3.4, we observe upward trend. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, Sorry, sure. uh, you, you mentioned that you are skin uh, because of fiber. Can, can you say a little more about this technique, uh, the fiber? Can you compare the, the you, can you use the fiber technique to compare the, the trend? And that's a very good agreement uh, between. Uh, maybe I did not explain it well. It's called five variables in it. Five variables means that it has five principal components. Two of them are mean sea level pressure in Darwin and in Tahiti. These two stations are commonly used to derive so-called Southern Oscillation Index. And this index is described as changing in atmospheric circulation, which happened uh, in that area and changes in this circulation. Well, uh, they indicates us if it's El Nino, warm episode or La Nina cold episode. Another three components are sea surface temperatures in those regions which I just mentioned before. Ninja 3, Ninja 4 and Ninja 3.4. So these five variables they are combined in one index and this one number gives us some indication similar to SOI or sea surface temperature, but we believe that it describes it better because ANSA is coupled ocean atmospheric phenomena. So SOI, as you know, is highly variable yeah. index, very highly variable, and it describes one side of the phenomena, atmospheric circulation. Sea surface temperature or sea surface temperature anomalies, they describe oceanic response. Combining them as one index, we believe give us certain advantage. And the, uh, you want to say something about your cosmic? <laughs> yeah, in the second half of your talk, Thomas, uh, Close to the end, you mentioned something about the casting. Uh, can you uh, say more about your brand? How we use the data, the radio adaptation data? I initiated this study very recently, and the result which I presented, in fact, are just results of pilot study. Uh, what we want 
to do from our perspective uh, as climatologist and meteorologist we want to have global coverage and high accuracy of uh, retrieval of atmospheric parameters and uh, yes refractivity is of importance for us but in fact what is even more important retrieval of temperature and moisture because these characteristics are directly applicable to our studies and this is what we can in fact compare with our long term observation using radius of data so as a first step this pilot study was focused on comparison between product which can be derived from cosmic radio occultation data and traditional radio zone observation how they correspond what would be the accuracy and well i am sure you know much more about this than me because i just began to study but uh, our stations they are clearly fixed on the continent you cannot move them around so depending on where this radio rotation event occurred, it could be closer or it could be further from the station. So as well as uh, temporal age, it can be very close, few minutes or an hour or two hours. So we were wondering what is the influence of spatial and temporal variation on accuracy of we compare these vertical profiles as obtained by radio zones and profiles as obtained by satellite emulsions, radio footage. Uh, in general, we were very happy with correspondence uh, uh, criteria which we use. Uh, we look at data in radius of 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers, and 300 kilometers and time uh, criteria one, two, and three hours. In general, we found that variation in distance can largely impair the time variation. And as far as accuracy is concerned, uh, for uh, troposphere middle and up, let's say above five kilometers, we found very reasonable correspondence between these two different and also we found that below five kilometers methodology needs to be improved if we want to have a reasonable okay. So what I'm going to do from now on, uh, we are finding our collaborators from Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology who are experts on this uh, uh, methodology professor. Uh, Jean working with me on this project and uh, through Australian Research Council's uh, scheme we established um, a closer collaboration with international center like uh, Joint Center for Satellite Data and Simulation in US to build up our capability to develop further methodologies and come up with better uh, one of the possibilities to improve uh, accuracy of orbit determination. This is what I believe would be the first step which my colleagues want to undertake under this project. Perhaps some other steps which we will find as a later in collaboration with other centers. Thank you.
let's look for the uh, for the future uh, collaboration. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dr. Newell is a uh, talk.